Greetings, Kerbonauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number two of Operation Gold Strike. Today, we are launching a base that is going to go down onto the surface of Minmus at the location of where we identified a nice concentration of ore, and we've left behind a rover to mark that spot. In our last episode, we launched the orbital scanner that went around in the polar orbit and took maps of the surface. And then we brought the rover down onto the surface itself, did a ground scan and a narrowband scan, found a nice concentration, drove over there, and that's where we're waiting. And that brings us back to the present where we have the base up inside the fairing and it is one wobbly looking payload up there. Fortunately, it doesn't seem to be having an effect on the rocket's trajectory. I'm flying it just fine. It's just that it's wiggling a lot up there. Normally, if I were using my KW rocketry fairings, I would just put some struts from the payload up into the fairing itself. But these new KSP version 102 fairings don't seem to want to let me put any struts up against them. Due to the shakiness of that payload, I'm taking it much easier on the gravity turn. Notice that we're already up to 8, 9, coming up on 10 kilometers, and we are still not pointing at the 45 degree mark, because as we continue that gravity turn, you can get a really good look now at what I was talking about. Look at how that thing is wiggling there. As the vehicle loses mass, I'm going to throttle back on it, keep it maybe at about one and a half G's of acceleration, just to make sure that nothing goes wrong. Because this is the true flight of this base, I've only done one simulation and I went straight from that into the real deal. Perhaps as I continue this series, I'll figure out how to make the struts work with the fairings. And while I think it would be awesome if you guys could give me suggestions, the fact is this entire series will probably be done done before I could ever get around to doing anything that you might suggest in the comments. Remember, this is a mini-series, and I, I guess I had promised last episode that I was going to give you updates on how episode 46 of Project Odyssey is coming along, but my plans have changed. I've decided to just go ahead and finish this entire mini-series all in one big go, and then go back to Project Odyssey and finish out episode 46, taking advantage of the time that this mini-series is going to by me so that I can then produce that episode. So you'll just have to keep that in mind as you're watching along here. You might see that I'm using some mods that to you are going to be out of date, but to me, everything I have is totally fresh as of today. So if something new comes out, I won't be able to make use of it. And anyone who says, hey, you should be using blah 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 mod, well, I won't be able to do that either because it's already going to be done. So getting back to this launch, you saw at the beginning that we did the same technique again where we wait until mission control is coming around and Minmus is rising over on the horizon. And then we lift off intending to go straight into a trajectory that will take us to Minmus without worrying about any sort of circularization burns. Due to the shaky liftoff, we aren't exactly where we would have liked to have been, so there's going to be a mid-course correction on this flight. For that reason, I have made a maneuver node that will ensure that our ascending node is ahead of us on the orbit. That way, when we get out a little further from where we are now, where it'll be a bit cheaper in order to make an inclination change, we can make a second maneuver that will alter the inclination and finish getting us on our intercept with Minmus. The payload here seems to be a little bit shaky still, but we're maintaining a good, well we were a moment ago, maintaining a good 3 G's and it was doing okay, so it seems like the whole non-strutted payload thing wasn't that big a deal. The first maneuver is complete and so we get to skip ahead at a higher warp speed until we get out to that point, right out there where the ascending node will allow us to do our second maneuver. But first, let's go take a look at the initial test. There was one simulation before we launched the real deal and several things went wrong with it and I can tell you what they were and how I fixed them. This was not technically a manned launch. The reason why you can see Jebediah in the lower right is I'm pretending that he's in the simulator room running the simulation of the flight and that he's not actually in this craft because technically the real launch doesn't have anybody manning it. 
So we get to the first problem. When the boosters decoupled, the separatrons were pointed too much straight in and that caused overheating and damage on the lower core. The next thing that happened is while I was examining the core, I lost control and realized that I'm going to have to be very careful about the flight when I launched the real one to make sure that as we were going through max Q, we didn't stray too far from the, the primary vector there. Another issue I saw is I had installed this mod called Scatterer that adds sort of an atmospheric scattering but it was creating these lines, these arcs across the sky. So I decided to take that back out again. Oh, I see the problem. We made our rocket out of rubber and styrofoam. Look how it bounces on the water. I thought we were making it out of metal. All right, we know how to fix that. Okay, seriously now though, we're going to go back to the present where we have reached our maneuver node and we're making the adjustment that brings in the intercept with Minmus and then move over to Minmus and give it just a little tiny extra touch on the engine to make sure that we're coming in nice and close or in this case colliding but we can fix that problem once we actually get into the SOI of Minmus. So that's what we'll do now warping ahead to get to that SOI change and then I'm going to experiment with the little buttons that are right next to the nav ball. Those little round circles, those are new in the version 1.0 and higher of KSP. And since I haven't been playing that version until I did this mini series right here, I haven't tried using those before. I used to have the exact same functionality in a MechJab window. So I'll be comparing the responsiveness of that MechJab window to the little buttons and see how I like it. As it turns out, I feel like the ones that are next to the nav ball aren't very responsive. They overcorrect, they take you past the point that you want to go to, and then they swing back again, and it's a little bit too wild. I find that the MechJeb one is still a bit better, so I think I'm going to continue using that one. Well, as you can see, I have a sliver of fuel left in the stage that I'm on right now, and I'm going to use that until there is nothing left in it. We're burning a radial maneuver right now to bring the orbit out so that we're not colliding and coming in a little bit more along the equator, although technically I do still need an inclination change just enough to be able to pass over our landing site later. But I think we'll be taking care of that once we're a bit more uh, circular, going down into the circularization burn. Then we'll add some inclination on there. You can see that our periapsis is right at the terminator of day and night as well, which means I'm going to want to come all the way around again anyway, so that we're landing in the daylight. Although later, when I go to check to see where my site is right now, I realize that it too is in the dark already, and so we need to go a couple laps around, waiting until it comes out into at least Minmus morning before we can go and land on the site. Nighttime at the rover has just barely begun as we're arriving here. Speaking of nighttime, that reminds me, power was a consideration in what we're doing here with the base. If it takes more than six hours to go all the way around from the beginning of night to Minmus morning, and we want to do something like run the drills all the way through that night, then we were going to need a tremendous amount of battery storage. And for that reason, I decided to not go with batteries. Instead, we have a couple of the new fuel cells on there, which also means that we're carrying a couple fuel tanks specifically to pump fuel down into the fuel cells to run all through the night. Now, chances are that's not how this is going to get used we're going to probably run it in the daytime but i was just thinking just in case we'll have that as an option the solar panels are enough to power it as long as the sun is up each one of those generates 18 energy per second and the drills are only 15 and the rest of the base doesn't use more than 18 with those combined so those solar panels should be enough Okay, so since we had to wait several laps for Minmus to go around and bring that landing site down closer to where our orbit's going to be, I decided to make small adjustments to my orbit, a little here and a little there. So each time I was passing through the periapsis, I might make another little change until finally I was happy with how low it was overall. And then about that point, we got to where it was time to make the final maneuver for our landing approach. I didn't like how my rover was showing up as a satellite, so I switched to it for just a moment and hit the rename button and then activated it as a rover instead of a satellite, and then switched back to our base. 
you can see how we're right around our periapsis. That's also the lowest point in the inclination. So it's going to be somewhere right around there that we would want to be landing. So we set up a maneuver node and drag it to where it's coming right over that rover. Start up the engines gently at first and then go full throttle until we get close ease back and stop it right there. So now we have a couple of minutes before we get to our true landing. So this is when I'm going to assemble the one piece of the base that didn't come in its proper position. In order to fit it inside the fairing, I had it sticking up above the rest of the base. But it is supposed to be a tower, like an observation tower that also keeps our solar panels. It has a little porch on it, so if anyone ever visits here, they can go and stand on the porch and look out. And there's a crew tube that goes down into the rest of the base where we have some living quarters and an airlock. The rest of the base is a couple of drills and the ore storage tanks. And our deorbit stage that we're going to be getting rid of soon, it's almost out of fuel. The reason why we weren't flying with it in this configuration, you can imagine, it's that it's going to be a bit more unstable as we come down. However, I think in general the gyroscopes ought to be able to keep us in place. But if the difference was between slightly difficult to use and not difficult at all, I just went with the not difficult at all option and now we'll go with the slightly more difficult landing. There we go, the observation tower is docked. There are a couple strategically located probe cores on this. Whenever I dock something up, I always select one of my probe cores or something that can be controlled from somewhere and I right click it and I say control from here just to make sure that I have it lined up correctly. I like to have my nav ball oriented in whatever fashion is that I'm doing, like if I'm landing then I want it one way, and if I'm flying along an orbit I want it a different way. So by having a couple probe cores in different locations and different orientations, I can switch back and forth to whatever it is that I think I need at that time. As it is right here, since we're still sort of deorbiting and using the stage that has some fuel on the bottom there, I have elected to control from here from the D orbit CPU. Once we no longer need that, we'll switch to one that's under the, the observation tower, and then we'll be lined up nicely in order to come down for a landing. The nav ball will rotate effectively 90 degrees, and it'll be much easier to see if we're going straight up and down or not. You will notice that I'm taking sort of the lazy way out on getting to where my landing is. I'm occasionally marking a new maneuver that will keep the end of my orbit right on the ground by the rover, but at the same time reduces the overall orbital velocity of the base. I will continue to do this over and over again as we get closer. Just move a little bit further ahead on the orbit pull back retro so that we're slowing down, but to make sure that we don't fall short of the destination, I also do a radial maneuver to pull up and sometimes adjust the purple up and down for the inclination to continue making sure that it comes down right on that rover. This process will go on and on until we get nice and close and run out of fuel in that little tank we have on the back side there, at which point we'll finally be able to decouple it and let it go down and crash onto the surface. So we flip the base so that it's going about straight up and down, use up the last of that fuel, and then decoupling here, the fuel tank will just shoot straight down at the ground. And after that, we can select control from here from the CPU that's attached to the observation tower. That reorients the nav ball, and now we have our landing engines activated. Each one of those has its own little fuel tank that we'll be using mostly up during our landing process. I have pulled in the solar panels just in case. I don't want to hit one of them by being angled just wrong as we were coming down or anything and we don't need that power right now we can open them back up again once we're on the ground now this landing approach looks a little jittery in the playback at six times normal speed but it wasn't like that it didn't feel unstable or anything at the time I think the jittery look is partially because it's going at 6x and partially because I kept on reorienting myself to make sure that I was coming down where I wanted and then right near the very, very end, I realized that even though I was close to the rover, I was coming down a bit on a slope. So I had to shift over to the side just a little bit right at the end 
and land myself on that basin floor. Safely on the ground, we can bring the solar panels back out. You can see that we've lost about one third or a quarter of our power, but once they're back out, that all recharges very, very fast. We also have a communications dish to open up to stay in contact with Kerbin. And then we activate our drills as well as the harvesting mode to see if we can start getting some of that luscious ore. Also, we were very close to the rover, but we weren't right on top of it, so I'm going to bring the rover over to us. Oops, that's right, you have to deactivate that CMG that's on the bottom. If you don't, then instead of rolling across the ground, it flips and rolls in a whole different way. We'll just park it right off the side of our base. Now, as I was coming back, I realized that the docking port on the back of the base where our refueling connecting ship is going to go is going to be angled out toward a slope. So I decided to pull the drills back in and lift up the base and flip it around, pointing it the other direction where that docking port will be out in the middle of the basin. We still have quite a bit of fuel left in our landing engines, so we make use of those one more time. You have to be careful on the landing engines though, because one pair will wear out quicker than the other. I guess you could rebalance the fuel into them, but I had set the thrust a little bit lower on one pair than I did on the other to make sure that the center of thrust would go right up through the center of mass of the base during the landing process. And there we go. You could see that the drills were bringing in ore as I right clicked on those tanks and showed that they were no longer zero. So now we just need to get our orbital space station going and bring over a ferry that will take the ore from the surface up to that station. So here we are at the bottom of the rocket we just launched and one of the things that you can see here is what I talked about during the segment about the failed simulation, how these were pointed too much straight toward this lower booster right here. So I just grabbed this and grabbed this and I gave them a little bit of a rotation and made them point toward the sides like that you can see. So then they weren't hitting this core booster and they weren't burning it up anymore. Other than that, you've got your basic lower booster here, a few fuel tanks that are underneath one of these main sails with the thrust set to 74 to make sure that our thrust to weight ratio here isn't too high. I've got about a 1.7 you can see on the side. I did not change the middle one here with the mammoth. That's because typically when you decouple the side boosters, you want your middle one to be full throttle. You want to go full throttle, in fact, from the ground all the way to orbit as much as you can. And if that middle one at full throttle is going to be a 1.55 thrust to weight, then that meant these outer ones were the ones I would need to adjust, and so that's what I did. You may notice along the side here that the textures are a little different. Don't let that fool you. This is still all stock. You can download this. Go down into the comments and find the link that'll take you to all the craft files and you can get this one. Remember, you just need to have the surface lights mod because you gotta have more lights. So anyway, we'll skip past our little decoupler there and some struts and work our way up here where you can see I have embedded a few retro boosters. I don't think, no, I didn't have any down at the bottom. They were just here so that when this one decouples, away this goes, leaving our upper stage that did a lot of the heavy lifting as far as getting us over to Minmus and everything. All right, so let's delete that and work our way up in here to take a look at the payload. Starting up at the top, you can see that I have put our little platform here with just some lights on it, some cubic struts and regular struts to make it look like railings. And on the outside there, we got our solar panels that will power our drills. The RCS tanks here and here were to provide enough RCS for these in order to do that maneuver where this is going to come off and then shift over here and dock onto the side like that. The way that I have it attached, you can see if we'll scroll in really close right here, right there, there's a cubic strut just barely buried into the side of this thing. And so this was attached right on that cubic strut. 
And then when it was time to let go, I simply clicked on this and said, undock. Even though it was attached to a cubic strut, you can still undock it. And then once it was undocked, the whole thing was able to shift over and redock over on here. Right up in there, you can see we have our remote control probe core. That's the one that we activated when we were coming in for our landing. There's another one over here, just in case I wanted to have access to an up and down probe core, although I ended up not needing that one. And then the other one is down here on the stage where we have our fuel here and our little engines for deorbiting and a good portion of the landing process. A little decoupler there, and then this whole thing was on a decoupler as well. Down here is where we have our docking port where the refueling ship is going to connect up. And then along the sides there, you can see we have our fuel tanks that feed into the fuel cell array, one on that side, one on that side, a couple fuel tanks here and here with engines for the landing, and the same thing up there, a couple fuel tanks and engines for landing. The backup batteries are up here, those are disabled. And this section up at the top right here, this represents my airlock. I'm assuming that they would go in that door there and then pressurize or depressurize this area here which would then allow access to the main living quarters if anyone were to need to visit the base with a ladder that runs up through the middle there to that observation deck just if they want to go up there. And then of course you saw that we have our drills on the side and three tanks here that can be filled up with ore. Presumably what's going to happen there is the drills would work 24-7 until these things are filled up. Then the refueling ferry would come, connect up right here, and transfer the three tanks worth over into that ship, and then that ship will lift off and head back to the space station. And that process could continue automated as many times as necessary to refuel however much space we're going to end up having on the space station that's going to be that refueling Grand Central. Also earlier I talked about how those fuel tanks were draining at different rates. Well that's because you see this one here, it shows that there's only 90% thrust whereas this one over here is 100% thrust. And that is because if we activate the center of mass and see that right there and then activate this, if this fuel tank gets removed, oh hold on we need the tower on here too. There we go, now the tower is on and the back tank is off and you can see that the center of thrust and the center of mass kind of go through each other right here. And I got that from reducing this because if we bring this back up again, see how it shifts just a little bit to the right and then there's another one on the other side. These were not symmetried, so I have to set that one separately there, see? So if we put those at 100% then it offsets just a little bit and that little bit right there was enough to make it unstable during landing, but drop it down to 90 and it works great. Alrighty, Kerbinauts, next time on Operation Gold Strike, we need to launch a couple things. One of them is a crew transfer vehicle, a test to see how we can transfer some crew off the ground up to a space station module that we're going to launch. And there will also be a few things to fix about this crew transfer vehicle. Three things that I learned as this one was going up. One is it has quite a bit of wiggle and we'll have to see if we can find out what that's coming from and fix that. So we hit the abort key which is an action group set up on the backspace, and send our crew flying through the air, heading back down into the ocean here, which will lead to another thing I need to figure out. You see there are some retro rockets on the capsule. They fire when you get close to the ground, and I need to find the exact right altitude to fire them so that they will begin and then end just as you're touching down. Going to have to use our texture replacer mod to change his suit, but we'll take care of all that next time on Operation Gold Strike. So until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.